This was classic work, work done by these two neurobiologists. Anyone who was in BioCore sort of went, me, went through me haranguing about how great these guys were. A pair of neuroscientists, Hubel and Wiesel, absolute giants in the field. In the 1950s, up to the 1960s, everybody thought that they had discovered exactly how the cortex worked. And what they found was a phenomenally clean, reductive world of how you extracted information from the visual world around you. I will spare you the details because it's not important, but what they basically showed was you could find individual cells in the retina that corresponded to individual neurons in the simplest part of the visual cortex. And between them, you had simple point-for-point -point reductive relationships. If you stimulated this one retinal cell, its associated neuron in this part of the cortex would get excited and have an action potential. If you shift your electrode over a smidgen and stimulate the one right next to it, the neuron right next to this one is going to get stimulated. In other words, if you know the starting state, which receptors in the eye have been stimulated, you have 100% predictability of which neurons up here are going to fire, and the converse, know which one's fired here, and you have complete information about the starting state. And what they did was begin to build on that. They showed that insofar as that first layer of the cortex had this one-to-one -one correspondence with one cell here to one cell there, what did individual neurons know about in this simple part of the visual cortex? These neurons knew how to recognize dots. Each neuron could recognize a dot and one dot only and was the only neuron that recognized it. This was a point-for-point -point reductive system and take all those individual little neuron component parts, each of which that knows something about one dot, and put them together and you could begin to get some information about what just hit the eye. What they then showed was the next layer of the cortex. And again, to simplify things as much as possible, what they began to see was you would now stimulate one of those retinal cells and one neuron in the first layer of cortex would get excited. Nothing would happen in the second layer. Shift over, stimulate the next one over, next one over, nothing in the next part of the cortex. Over, 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 and then suddenly one of the neurons in the second cortex gets excited. If and only if you first stimulate this photoreceptor, followed by this, followed by this, followed by this, followed by this. What does that neuron know about? Light moving in a straight line in this direction. That part of the cortex could extract the information from that first layer and put them together and get different sorts of information. And thus you would have another neuron there that would code for an angle that was slightly different, another one there, and then ones for different parts of the cortex, different parts of the visual system, and very long lines or very slow moving lights or things like that. What do neurons in that second layer know about? They know how to recognize straight lines. And you could see, again, this is a reductive system because you know the wiring that goes from one layer, from the eye to this layer to this layer, and thus, if you know what's going on here, you can work backwards and know what's happening there and what's happening in the eye and same way in the other direction. A point-for-point -point system where now you're beginning to extract a higher level, a hierarchy of analysis, but the same exact reductionism. And just to then begin to show what they then went on to, again, this is very simplified, now you begin to get neurons here. One of them will respond to this line. Another will respond to this line. Another will respond to this line. If and only if these three neurons are firing simultaneously, one neuron in the next layer of the visual cortex would fire. What do neurons there know about? Each one knows about a curve and one curve only. Same exact thing again, which is point-for-point -point reductionism. If you want to understand the system, you need to understand how every single neuron is wired to every next one in line. And once you got that, all you need to know is what information, what activity is happening at any level, and you've got 100% knowledge of what will be going on here and here and here, a purely reductive system.
Everybody loved this. This was the greatest stuff that happened in neurobiology. This was arguably the most important work in neurobiology between like 1950 and 1975. The two of them got their Nobel Prize. People would have given them a dozen if they could have because what had they just solved? They just showed how the brain processes sensory information, how it extracts information from the world around and turns it into complex bits of sensory information because it was completely completely obvious at this point what was going to happen, which was above this, there would be a layer that had neurons that could respond to a certain number of curves simultaneously. It can start seeing three dimensions. And then above that is one where the three dimensions are changing over time. It can detect movement of a three-dimensional object. And the notion was you would be able to just go up layer after layer of reductive pointillist wiring. And way up on top, you would have this super duper layer of visual cortical processing and all the way up on top, somewhere up there you would now have a neuron that knew one thing and one thing only, knew how to recognize your grandmother's face at this angle. And the notion would be that right next to it was another neuron that recognized your grandmother's face at this angle. And then one like this. And right behind were the rows of neurons recognizing your grandfather. And everybody decided, this is it. Just take this world of Hubel and Wiesel stepwise extraction of information and keep going. And that's how the brain winds up recognizing faces. And meanwhile, people subsequently showed in the auditory cortex that the correspondence between one cochlear cell, one hair cell there, recognizing a single note up to chords, up to OK. So now you go up enough layers there, and you will find the layer that where single neurons will know your grandmother's favorite symphony. And that's it all the way up. You would eventually find neurons that were specialized in really complex sensory information. And all you had to do was just keep going like this in this purely reductive way, and you've got it up there on top. And people at the time actually did refer to these as grandmother neurons. The notion that enough layers up here, you would get neurons that responded to a really complex thing, and only to that, and it was the only neuron that responded to that point for point, one thing and one thing only, and that all you needed to do was just keep doing this, and you would eventually get neurons that recognized your grandmother. So right around the time that Hubel and Wiesel got their third layer here, and this took them about 15 years, they decided to go study something else in the visual system. And that turned out to be at least as interesting as this stuff. But everybody else leapt in at that point to try to find the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer. And Hubel and Wiesel had shown a remarkable bit of wisdom or intuition by bailing on the field at that point. Because to this day, hardly anybody has ever shown the existence of a grandmother neuron all the way down there. They simply don't exist. OK, that's a lie. They do exist, but there's very few of them. There's sparse coding. Occasionally, you find neurons that show grandmother neuron-like processes, neurons, a single neuron that will respond to a face, and only one type of face, way up there in many layers of visual cortical processing. There are some of those. And there was a paper in Nature some years ago, which was one of the weirdest papers I have ever seen. Really interesting in terms of what it showed, but weird from the standpoint of what were these folks thinking to actually test this? And they were recording from the very upper layers of visual cortex in monkey brains. And they found some neurons that responded. One neuron would respond only to a certain human face. And coding a grandmother type neuron, here's the bizarre thing in that paper, what they discovered were neurons in the brains of these rhesus monkeys where there would be a single grandmother-esque neuron. And what they found was a neuron that would respond to a picture of Jennifer Aniston. You think I'm being sarcastic. They found a Jennifer Aniston neuron, which would respond to a photograph of her at all sorts of different angles, a caricature, all of that. They went and showed the grandmother specificity of this by showing that, and this is in the paper, it did not respond to Julia Roberts. It did not respond to Brad Pitt. Perhaps very meaningfully with that, it did not respond to Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt in the same picture. And God knows what was going on with Angelina Jolie with that. The one other, OK, this shows how bizarre it is. The one other thing they discovered this neuron would respond to was a picture of the Sydney Opera House. <laughs> 
What's up with that? So this is a, a two knowledge, almost a perfect reductive grandmother neuron. The bizarre thing being, what made these guys figure? I know. Let's go get a picture of Jennifer Aniston and show it to the rhesus monkey and see what happens. Where'd that come from? I recall there was not a whole lot of illuminating information in the methods section as to where those sort of pictures came from. But so there are some of these. Some of them do exist. Cases of what people in the field call sparse coding, where you only need a few neurons to recognize some really fancy things like Jennifer Aniston. Nonetheless, the vast, vast majority of the attempts to find grandmother neurons failed dismally for a very simple reason. Okay, how many neurons do you need where each one knows one dot and one dot only? You need the exact same number of neurons as the number of photoreceptors in your retina. How many neurons do you need in this layer that turns these into lines? Well, you need one that's going to respond to a line of this length, and then one that will respond to this length, and one of this length, and one of that length, and then one that's a slightly different angle. And all that. You need like 10 times more neurons in this layer than this to be able to pull off that processing. How many neurons do you need in this layer? Like tenfold, hundredfold more than here. And how come you don't even have the next layer, let alone grandmother neurons and any sort of numbers? Because you run out of neurons. There's not enough neurons in the brain, let alone the visual cortex, to process stuff that way. You can't have a layer above that because you run out of neurons. In other words, there's not enough neurons in the brain to do face recognition in a point-for-point -point reductive manner. The system breaks down because of lack of enough numbers of things. And what people have been doing ever since then, what's become the dominant sort of approach in that field, is an explicitly non-reductive approach, which is now looking at something called neural networks information, the really fancy complex information, like what everybody else from Friends looked like except for the Aniston neuron, really complex information is not coded for in a single protein, a single synapse, a single neuron. It's coded for in patterns, in patterns of activation across hundreds, thousands of neurons, networks that are interacting. So you have a complete crashing and burning of what up to here seemed like the greatest demonstration of point-for-point -point reductive processing of sensory information, which just led you all the way up to grandmother neurons, and they basically don't exist because you run out of neurons at this point. You can't solve the problem of recognizing faces by using reductive component part neurobiology.